good morning in the early 1950s in Grand Junction, Colorado. A young World War II trained pilot does a pre-flight check of his Beechcraft airplane. The destination, Moab, Utah. The cargo, nuclear scientists and engineers bound for the uranium capital of the world. In the coming months and years, he would make many more similar flights to other mining areas in Colorado, Utah, and Arizona. On that same morning, a young secretary for the Atomic Energy Commission is typing a top secret report for a field engineer that has recently returned from a field uh, with his notes from a field trip to southern Utah. She doesn't really know the magnitude of what she's typing, but she knows it has to be correct and it has to be done today. The two people in this scenario are my parents several years before they were married and many, many years before I was born. They were a small part of a decade-long uranium rush in Colorado's plateau region sparked by the post-war effort to develop nuclear power. While I knew their involvement before, I didn't realize the significance of what happened during that time that so greatly changed the world we live in. Today I want to share with you some of what I learned from my research piece. So I did some on online research from different articles from the Atomic from the Department of Energy, uh, Utah State University, some various other online articles, and my dad's flight blog book. Lieutenant General Leslie Groves was the director of the Manhattan Project, a wartime effort to build a nuclear bomb to end the war. They needed a lot of uranium to do this project, and there wasn't a lot of supply. There weren't many mines, and many of them were outside the U.S. So we bought the entire stockpile from the Vanadium Corporation of America, about 800 tons of uranium ore. But after the project was done and the war was finished, the U.S. only had about 100 pounds of enriched uranium. So developing domestic mining to supply the uranium that would be required for the Cold War effort that was coming up became a priority for the country. Uranium-235, the unstable isotope of that element, is the only natural element that can sustain a chain reaction, so that was going to be necessary as the country developed its nuclear technology. The Atomic Energy Commission was created to take over the Manhattan Project to foster and support the development of nuclear power for peacetime purposes, both uh, military as a deterrent and as electrical power generation. The act was signed on August 1st, 1946 by President Truman. Shortly after the formation of the commission, it announced an incentive for uranium materials, $7,000 a ton, or 0.2% concentration of uranium oxide, also called pitch blend or uraninite, and a $10,000 bonus for the delivery of 20 tons of 20% enriched uranium oxide, thus creating the first government-sponsored mineral rush in history. But by the late 1950s, the Commission had more than enough uranium for its research purposes and withdrew its subsidized buying. Without this price support, the, the price plummeted and all but the largest uranium producers were forced out of business. When the Atomic Energy Commission announced its incentive program, tens of thousands of prospectors flocked to the southwest in search of uranium. Most were not successful and left only with their guidance counter that they came with. There were, however, a, very, a few very successful miners that was the focus of the media's attention and kept people interested in striking it rich. Charlie Steen, the king of uranium, was an unemployed oil geologist from Texas who came to the area and discovered some pitch blend in the Chinle Formation, which is on the Colorado Plateau, where it had not previously thought to have existed. Although he reportedly made about $130 million 
during the, the rush, he lost most of his fortune due to the collapse of the market and bad investments. Another prospector, Vernon Pick, sold his mine for $9 million. And those were the two main popular figures. By the early 1950s, there were more prospectors in the plateau than <coughs> the entire California gold rush by a margin of 30 to 1. He created more millionaires than the Colorado Silver Rush and the Arizona Copper Rush. The Iranian viewers all over the media glamorizing the lifestyle of a prospector. Creating a national perception that anyone with grit, determination, and a Geiger counter could make it big. Well, those are the two prospectors. Books and magazine articles were prevalent on prospecting. Prospecting kits were marketed, including the deluxe model for 3500 which included a Jeep. <laughs> Outfits were romanticized the uranium mining industry. And there was even a board game about being a prospector. As with many boom and bust situations, there was essentially no regulation. Many workers were exposed to high levels of radiation whose dangers were not fully understood and were not in the interest of the companies to correct. Mines lacked proper ventilation and many times radon concentrations were a thousand times more than the safe level. Miners liked their cigarettes while they were working on the ground, but radioactive particles attached to the smoke and went deep into their lungs. They often went home with uranium-coated clothing, prolonging their exposure and exposing their family. So sky-high rates of lung and other cancers became common. One native reported that as a boy he went to the mine with his dad for take your son to work day. And half the million sites of that era are now EPA Superfund sites, which means they're basically unusable. The world changed greatly in the years after World War II as the United States strived to maintain every possible edge in the Cold War. A lot of time, energy, and human life was spent in pursuing this new powerful technology. My parents' involvement was not grandiose, grandiose nor glamorous, but I'm proud of the parts they played. I'm glad I learned more about it.